My name is Abby Ingber. I am the executive director of the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder. We are a nonprofit organization that helps family members and loved ones who have someone in their life dealing with borderline personality disorder or emotion dysregulation. We do this through advocacy efforts, outreach and awareness, education, and research. We are widely known for our successful Family Connections program, which was created by our presenter today. Family Connections is a 12-week free class led by trained family members and clinicians. The purpose of Family Connections is to provide psychoeducation, skills, and support to improve one's relationship with their loved ones who have borderline personality disorder, traits of BPD, or emotion dysregulation. We offer the classes throughout the United States in person and through Zoom. We are also in 28 countries throughout the world. Please feel free to use the chat or question and answer feature to pose a question that is relevant to this topic. And at the end of the presentation today, there'll be some time for Dr. Frazetti to answer the questions. I am joined today by Tina Moore, Doreen Dawson, and Nancy Epstein. All three are experienced Family Connections leaders and staff of our organization. They will be monitoring the chat and Q&A during this presentation. Our presenter, Dr. Alan Frazetti, has adapted and implemented dialectical behavior therapy for multiple underserved populations and developed many successful DBT programs for people with BPD and other problems with emotion regulation and many programs for couples, parents, and families. His research focuses on the connections between severe psychopathology and interpersonal family processes and their interplay with emotion dysregulation. In addition to the hundreds of research papers Dr. Frazetti has authored, he has lectured and trained professionals in more than two dozen countries on BPD, DBT, and on family interventions. Without further ado, Alan, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks so much, Abby and um, welcome everybody uh, who's here now in real time, uh, Friday afternoon at three o'clock, but uh, also a warm welcome to anybody who's gonna <clears throat> get on and, and watch this uh, at a later time as, uh, as a recording. So we thought it might be a nice idea uh, to think about emotion dysregulation uh, more generally, uh, not just as something that accompanies more severe disorders like borderline personality disorder and problems like suicide and self-harm and substance use and so forth. But to recognize that when things are difficult, actually we, we can all get dysregulated. There are uh, any number of ways that, that we can all be dysregulated. And managing our fear and managing our grief during this difficult time uh, is really what we're gonna focus on today for everybody. This is relevant, I hope, uh, to anybody living through these difficult times. So I want to start by noticing that we, we're kind of living in a paradox right now. Uh, on the one hand, we have these severe limitations, uh, these restrictions on the things that we can do. Um, depending on where you are, those restrictions might be very complete to the point of being quarantined, or they could be more modest uh, and loosened up a little bit, but there still are likely to be, wherever you are, uh, many restrictions, closed businesses, closed restaurants, uh, workplaces, many workplaces that are unavailable, lots of unemployment and so forth. So on the one hand, there are these limitations. We have a lack of access to all the things that we typically do, where we can go and so forth. And therefore, there are fewer things in, in some sense, to interest us or excite us. Yet, on the other hand, here we are feeling overwhelmed. And I can't tell you how many people, which is all, just about 100% of people that I encounter, uh, colleagues, friends, family members, as well as people in the clinic, who just feel overwhelmed, at least intermittently. So I'd like to, to talk about that, how it is that with, in some ways, with fewer things to stimulate us, uh, in, in one way, we feel very overwhelmed. Well, I think you can see from this, uh, this slide, which is, uh, I guess, <laughs> it's an adult collage, 
you know, my brain has too many tabs open, right? Many of us are living like we are right now, looking at a few computer screen, multitasking, way too many things to do, all kinds of demands on us in the moment, and all kinds of concerns about where things are going to go uh, next week, next month, rest of this year, even into 2021. Um, I'm sure that everything that's of concern to us isn't represented on this particular slide, but if you just take a quick look at it, you'll see there are all kinds of things here. Emotions, and of course we have the coronavirus itself, and healthcare related issues, and political related issues, and relationships, and finances, and things we can't do, and lots and lots of emotions. Um, as well as the news screaming at us you know, on a quite regular basis. So with this in mind, um, with this idea that there's just all these, all these so many things to overwhelm us, I want to start with just a 30 second primer on emotion science. Um, those of you who know me know that it's, I'm not actually capable of doing anything in 30 seconds, but a, a brief pr primer on emotion science. Um, this will help everything else that we're going to talk about today makes more sense. First of all, um, contrary to how we talk about emotions, emotions are not things that we have. We don't carry around with them, uh, them with us, like on our shoulders or someplace in our brain. Emotions are actually things that we do. They're not things we carry around. And of course, they're multiply determined. They come from, in part, our physiology and our neurobiology, but also our psychological selves, our emotions, right, uh, themselves uh, are part physiology and part neurobiology, but also part attention. But they're also influenced enormously by social factors and cultural factors. There are all kinds of things that influence the emotional experiences we're having right now. So it's easy to think about thinking. Thinking is something we do. We don't say, oh, I carry my thinking around with me. And when we talk about a thought, we know we pluck that thought out of an ongoing stream of thinking. Emotions are exactly like that. Emotions are things we're doing all the time. We're having experiences of an emotional nature all the time. When we say, oh, I'm having an emotion, or I feel sad, we're just plucking that emotion out, out of the stream of ongoing emotions. And all these things are influencing emotion all the time. Now, on the one hand, that could seem very overwhelming, but on the other hand, I find that very reassuring. There's so many things determining our emotion. That means we have all kinds of choices about things that we can do to change our emotional experience or change our relationship to our emotional experience so we can have a lot less suffering and feel a lot less overwhelmed. And that's a big part of what I want to talk about today. Similarly, emotions are like any other thing we do, like any behavior. They can be well-practiced and easy to do, or easy to feel, or they can be difficult to do. So, for example, if you've been driving for a long time, getting on the road, pulling you know, out onto the road, pulling into traffic, parking your car might seem very easy. That was not always easy, if you remember when you started to learn. And in some situations, the things that are easy right now can become very difficult. So, for example, if you grow up in the United States or in Canada or any of the many places in the world where we drive on the right, and then you decide you're going to go visit Australia or New Zealand or the UK, uh, and you're driving on the left, all of a sudden this thing that might seem very easy becomes very difficult, and vice versa. If you're used to driving on the left and you go someplace where they're driving on the right, it's not easy to do. Emotions are the same way. Think about this in your own close relationships. Somebody that you love, that's often easy to do. You see a picture of someone you love and you have this, wow, all of a sudden I'm feeling loving. If I, if I think about my family, it's not difficult for me just to feel a, that warm sensation of love. I just think about it. It's something I do a lot. It's easy to do. However, if you've ever had an argument with somebody, and I know you have, okay, because we all do, at that moment it may be very, very hard to do love. I mean, it's like it's not harder to do it right now. It's a little like going to the UK and trying to drive on the left. Ooh, I know how to drive. I can't do it so easily here. I've really got to work at it. And our emotions are just like that. 
And so when we struggle to have certain emotions because they're overwhelming, we've got to think, okay, we've got to do something different to be able to move to the right or move to the left and do it differently. Also, emotions can be primary emotions or they can be secondary emotions. Alan, can A I just interrupt for one second? Some people are saying that they're having trouble hearing. Can you just move closer to your microphone? Okay, I've got a microphone on. Um, is, is this better? Yes. Okay. I don't know what's different, but I've got my microphone on, and if that doesn't work, I'll take it off and use the web. Sorry about that. So emotions can be primary or they can be secondary. Uh, primary emotions means, it just means that it's connected to what's going on right now. It makes, it's easy to understand. So if you're at a, the light turns green and you pull through the light and somebody runs through the red light, you feel fear. That makes perfect sense. I just connected my fear to that situation. And when I tell anybody about it, it's easy for them to understand my emotional experience. However, through learning or other means, judgments, we instead can have a different emotion in that situation. Anybody ever notice when you get cut off on the road that you feel angry or know somebody who does? That's a good example where fear is actually the primary emotion because it's a dangerous situation. And in dangerous situations, people feel afraid. However, with enough conditioning, some people might actually feel overwhelmed feeling fear and don't like feeling fear. And actually feeling angry gives them a sense, sometimes a false sense of empowerment. And so they go straight to anger. And they're really angry when somebody cuts them off because they're being judgmental. That person shouldn't have done that. So to keep this in mind, because it turns out that um, our secondary emotions are the ones that get us in trouble. They're the ones that really get us dysregulated. They're the ones that are really responsible for our suffering. Our primary emotions, if we can learn to just notice them and handle them, rarely will dysregulate us. I also just want to notice that fear and grief, although they're two completely different classes of emotions, I'm mean, sorry, fear and grief on the one hand and sadness on the other hand, although they're completely different classes of emotion, they're actually related. In some ways, they're two sides of the same coin because a lot of fear, when it's not right in front of us, is about the fear of loss in the future, which is actually grief when we lose things. So in some ways, that fear of loss is a fear of sadness. And so we're going to talk about fear and grief and sadness altogether. Grief and sadness on the one side, fear, worry, anxiety on the other side. And as I said, dysregulated emotions are typically secondary emotions, and that particular kind of suffering can be reduced by finding our primary emotions. All right, maybe more than 30 seconds, but that gets us started. All right, so what are the sources of our distress right now? Uh, it's 2020, we have a lot going on in the world. What are some of the sources of our distress? Well, one of them is, of course, the judgments that we make. It's very interesting. Um, we've known uh, a lot about judgments for a while. Judgments go hand in hand with secondary emotions. When we get judgmental of other people, we typically get very angry at them. When we get judgmental about ourselves, we feel bad about ourselves. We feel embarrassed or humiliated or, or shamed. Judgments take us away from our more primary emotions. Like in those same situations, we might in fact be, be feeling disappointed or worried or some other emotion. But when we get judgmental, it's really hard to stay with those primary emotions. I'm going to come back to this. So I'm going to identify um, five different sources of distress, and then we're going to go and talk about what we can do about each of them. Um, so judgments create anger, embarrassment, and excess suffering. All right, that's number one. Number two, a source of distress right now, of course, is fear. Fear can be justified. There are lots of dangerous things going on, right? Uh, the coronavirus is dangerous. Uh, you may know somebody who's been ill. 
you may know somebody who's died from the coronavirus. You may yourself in other ways be really limited, severely impacted by the virus and the associated phenomena. So that fear is justified, and fear, of course, by itself is very painful. When it's big enough, of course, um, and this is when there's actual danger and there's a high risk, and again, it's a risk of loss, when it's actual danger, it can actually start to feel not only stressful, acutely stressful, but it can become traumatic. And if it lasts long enough or it's big enough, we can start to suffer the experiences of traumatic responses. These, of course, can be avoided by managing that fear in a new way. And we'll talk a little about that. One of the biggest uh, sources of distress for many people right now is the uncertainty. We don't really know what's going to happen. We don't know if our loved ones are going to get sick or if we are, what kinds of restrictions there might be, whether there'll be financial consequences for us, health-related consequences, as well as we don't know what kinds of other losses there might be depending on how these restrictions play out, if there's another wave of the virus in the fall or in the winter. All these things are very uncertain. And of course, uncertainty really means it's unpredictable, that we don't have much control over it. And many people start to ruminate and churn over and over, what if, what if, what if, what if. The trouble is that this distresses us further. It's actually not a particularly terrific use of our energy, and it makes us miserable. We're going to talk a little bit about how to break out of this pattern of getting stuck in the uncertainty with a lot of unnecessary suffering. There's also unjustified fear. Now, this is tricky, okay, because unjustified fear is when there's no present or imminent danger. That doesn't mean that the fear's not real, okay? It doesn't mean it's not valid in some way. But if it's not present right now or imminent right now, it's not the thing that's going to mobilize us effectively. So, for example, if, uh, if, I, if I'd been in a car accident uh, a month ago and say I hurt my neck and it was, it was a kind of ugly accident and now I've got a, the first time you're picking me up to take me to physical therapy in a, in a different world where physical therapy office is open, I might start to shake and have a lot of panic and fear just as I go to get in your car, even though you may be a very safe driver, you may have never had a car crash, your car may be very safe, and you may only be going three quarters of a mile up the road. Now, I want to call that unjustified fear because in the moment, there is no danger. But I want you to see how valid the fear is, but it's not valid because it's presently dangerous. It's valid because of something that happened, because of the conditioning that has happened. So we've got to get past that, right? We don't just say, oh, because I have fear, we won't go. I won't get in the car. What will happen, of course, is my fear will never go away. In fact, this is one of those examples of, you know, as uh, my parents and grandparents used to say, when you fall off the horse, you got to get back on the horse. But of course, you got to get back on a horse that's safe, that's not going to trample you, right? So it's unjustified when there's no present or imminent danger. We'll talk about that some more. And then finally, losses. We have a lot of losses these days. There are so many things that have changed. And the losses around us, big and small, some of them could be enormous, like the death of a loved one. Um, but other losses can be similarly difficult, um, not just uh, as enormous as the loss of a loved one, but pretty big, like the loss of a job, loss of income. Uh, but then there are more moderate losses, like not being able to see friends, not being able to do the things that we like to do. Um, we'll come back to this. It's not just the losses that are the source of the distress but what we do with them. How do we grieve those losses? Or do we inhibit that grieving or fail to grieve in some way? That compounds the loss and doesn't let us get through the loss through successful grieving 
to the other side. In, we, instead, we end up self-invalidating. We say, oh, it shouldn't bother me. It's not that big a deal. Everybody else is going through the same thing, which, although those are all true, they're actually kind of beside the point. The fact is, they are losses. We are sad. We are disappointed. We do have things to grieve. Or, if that feeling is too big, we might do things to numb out. That's anything that's the psychological equivalent of putting our heads in the sand. That could be getting stuck in playing video games or getting stuck in online kind of mindless activities. Uh, it also could be using substances to numb out, to escape that emotion or avoid the, the experience of sadness and grief. We'll talk about some of the things that we can do to successfully grieve without getting stuck in it and without feeling overwhelmed. Okay, so let's turn our attention to um, what we can do. So, first of all, with judgments. Judgments are, are a kind of spin that we put on things. They're saying things are right or wrong, they shouldn't be this way, when in fact they are this way. Instead, when we simply bring our attention and notice things as they are and describe them, it tends to go a lot better. So here's what I want you to do, okay? I want you to think about right now, I want you to uh, think about a situation maybe today or this week, very recently, where you are pretty judgmental, um, maybe really angry at somebody else or something in the world. And part of that component was that it shouldn't be this way. Um, that somebody was completely wrong. You've kind of got some self-righteous indignation going. All right, so take that, conjure that up in your mind. And what I want you to say, and it's just a notice, what does that feel like? What does that anger feel like? And what I'd like you to try instead is to simply say to yourself, I really don't like this. I just don't like it. Okay, as big as you want, as much as you want, okay, as loud as you want. And then say, what don't I like about it? What is it that I don't like? Is it what's bothering? My guess is, as you think about this, you're going to notice there's, there might be some loss, some disappointment. It's not what you wanted. That's disappointing. Or it's dangerous. Or it's increased danger. That's scary. That's fear. So when you find that more primary emotion without any judgments, I want you just to say, yeah, of course, of course I feel sad. Of course I feel disappointed. Of course I feel worried about that. Of course I do. Take a breath and notice, how does that feel? How does that compare with being angry and judgmental? Now, this is a 30 second practice and I'm sure that for some people, it might take longer. So if you're watching this in real time, you might go practice this later and give yourself two or three minutes to practice it. If you're watching this as a recording, I would encourage you to hit the pause button and give it some time and really allow yourself to identify what is it you don't like about it. The issue is not that you've got too much emotion about it. You have as much emotion about it as you have. The issue is how can you be accurate about identifying that emotion? What don't we like about it? What's is it sad? Is it disappointing? Is it something that's a loss? Is it scary and worrisome? What's going on? Okay. Part of getting through judgments is also temporal. It means doing one thing right now, staying in the present moment not getting stuck lamenting things that already happened. We can grieve them, but that's different than getting stuck in it shouldn't have been that way, it shouldn't have been that way. Or getting stuck in the future, something that hasn't happened yet, being overly fearful, unnecessarily fearful about something that hasn't happened yet. So part of, of being non-judgmental is also staying in the present along with this, bringing our attention to what's real, what we can describe, including our emotions. 
when we step away from anger, we stop a cycle, right? That anger cycle escalating anger and judgments, more anger, more judgments, more anger, more judgments, okay? Or judgments about ourselves leading to feeling humiliated, more self-judgments, more humiliation. Those cycles create an enormous amount of suffering that's totally unnecessary and unhelpful. And so just like this, 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 this photo shows, when you pull away, that incendiary cycle stops. And then we're, we're free of it. It doesn't necessarily make everything okay, but it can stop making it worse. And making, not, not making it worse can be an enormous victory in the short term. Okay, what about justified fear? Justified fear is really tricky. What if you're a healthcare worker? What if you're one of those people working in another essential service that actually bears some real risk right now? What do we do with that? Okay. Well, first of all, this is going to be easy to say and hard to do. So let me say it first. The idea is to do what we can to make it safer and then not focus on the fear. Then let the fear go. Okay. Now, what does that mean? All right, what does that mean? So if you're a healthcare worker, it means donning a mask and um, maybe a face shield and whatever protective equipment you need, doing absolutely everything in your power to be as safe as possible and to continue that practice very vigilantly in that situation. Okay, if you're doing other essential work that's maybe not quite as risky, you're working in a grocery store, you're working someplace that where there are people, you know, doing essential services, many, many things. Um, take the level of precaution that the situation requires, stay safe enough, do what you can, and then focus on all the other things that are still there. All the other things. If you're a healthcare worker, focus on the fact that in fact, at that moment, you're doing something that's really helpful for other people. You have special skills that are desperately needed right now and so thoroughly appreciated by you know, just about everybody. That's, that's not, that doesn't make your risk go down, but it does help your brain be more balanced. There's fear on the one side that you're managing as well as you can, and then there are all these other things that are meaningful and important that if you only focus on the fear, you'll miss. So this is tough. It also means that even if you're a healthcare worker in a very high risk situation or an essential worker who's in risky situations or just an ordinary person uh, that's not at much risk right now, it's also really important to notice when it's not risky. So if you're a healthcare worker, after you get home and you've peeled off all your stuff and put it in the wash, or take it a shower, or put on some clean clothes, leave the risk where it was, outside the door. You've created a safe environment at home. Now bring your attention to that safe environment. Live in the safe environment. Enjoy the safety of this environment. This is absolutely essential because our brains just can't tolerate that much, that much fear. It's not necessary when it's not present. We know that when we go back to work tomorrow, we will do everything that we can to manage the safety, to make it as safe as possible. But right now, that's not, it's not dangerous right now. Right now, you're just watching a movie. You're having a conversation with your child or your partner, or you're maybe reading a book or listening to music. Okay. Those are things to enjoy and spend time doing and let your brain cool off because it's spending enough time in risky, dangerous situations. All right, what about uncertainty and this loss of control that so many people tell me about and the feeling of being overwhelmed that comes with it? The trouble with uncertainty is absolutely everything about the future is uncertain. Okay. 
And I don't mean to be glib, and I certainly don't mean to be invalidating. But in some way, in one very important way, this is no different for anybody than it was six months ago before we ever heard of the COVID virus. Okay. Um, in fact, nothing about the future is certain, or at least the farther away we get from this moment, nothing about it is certain. So how do we manage it typically? All right. Well, part of what we do is we build structure, familiarity, and include in our structure the schedule we have for our day, the things that we plan, include things that are important to us, things that give us joy, that soothe us, that give us meaning, that interest us, that excite us, that just help us have a life that's really worth living, that's worth living in. Okay, we. When our structure is changed, like it is right now, we have to build a new structure. And we have to make sure to include everything that we can that matters to us. Things that have meaning, things that are fun, things that are enjoyable, things that are soothing, things that are social. Things that actually help us have a, a life worth living right now, an enjoyable life right now, for most of the moments of our day. Recognizing that some of those moments are going to be tough, they're really going to be tough. But in between, we have the structure to bring us back to meaningful activities, to meaningful things. We can also be purposeful in our consumption and our exposure. Okay, big words, consumption and exposure. Now, consumption here, this is a term um, that I think is, I'm going to use a little differently. When you think of consumption, you probably think of eating something, and certainly that's one way to consume. But when you think about consumers, right, consumers are bringing things into their lives, okay? We're all consumers, but not just in a purchasing sense, but we're consumers in terms of where we put our attention. What do we consume, not just with our gastrointestinal system, our food, but what do we consume with our eyes? What do we spend time looking at? What do we consume with our ears? What do we listen to? What do we consume with our, with our sense of touch? Okay. Our tactile senses. What do we consume in, in other ways with smell? Okay. What are we doing? Okay. Making choices about what we consume. So for example, if, and I mean no criticism by this, but if you are a person who leaves the television news on or the radio news on a lot, Frankly, there's not that much new news over the course of the day. And during these difficult times, you're going to be consuming a lot of very stressful stuff that's actually no different than it was an hour ago or two hours ago or three hours ago. Most of it's not different from yesterday. A little bit might be more. Consuming all of that stressful content can overwhelm our brain. Instead, we could be turning the news off. We could be turning the TV or the radio off and purposefully choosing to consume something else with our eyes and with our ears. Do absolutely something else. And the exposure part, that's a psychology term that means that we're going to expose ourselves to, not in the crude sense, to the fact that it's safe. We're going to be present. We're going to notice it's safe. We're going to consume things that are safe and Meaningful and important relationships, sounds, music, books, okay, and expose ourselves to the safety of it, the enjoyment of it, the meaningful parts of it. This is absolutely essential. So right now, I want you to take a second, okay, and I want you to think, what have you consumed today that didn't help? that actually, in retrospect, contributed to stress and burden, to fear in an unnecessary way, in an unhelpful way, contributed to your anxiety, guilt, or even grief in an unnecessary way, even for five minutes. And what could you have done differently? What could you have consumed during those five minutes or during that hour that actually could have been pleasant, relaxing, 
enjoyable, meaningful. It doesn't have to be fun. It could be hard. It could be even emotionally difficult, but also emotionally satisfying. Maybe it's contributing to another person, listening to another person with compassion. Maybe it's doing something soothing for yourself. Maybe it's learning something. That's what, what we mean by making purposeful choices about consumption. So I encourage you um, to sit down and think about what choices can you make about where you direct your attention and therefore what we consume and how could we swap out some things that maybe are not particularly healthy in our consumption and swap in healthier ones. Now, the other thing is that there's so many stressors around us. There's so many things going on. And even if we do these things really well, not everybody around us is going to do it. And there's a certain contagion in stress, right? If, even if you come into a situation that you're feeling, feeling fairly balanced, if you come into a situation and the other three people or five people or one person in your family is really stressed out, it's hard not to get sucked into that. So we've got to give our brains a break. Okay. Now, I would contend that if you can stay grounded, if you can stay peaceful during those moments, that that's actually very helpful to people around us, that, that they will gravitate toward your peacefulness. That's a hard thing to do, nevertheless. However, in this time of great uncertainty and unpredictability, it may make sense to do some things every day that are purposefully predictable, things that are purposefully soothing. Now, don't laugh too hard about what I'm going to say, but one thing that you could do is you can do things you've done before. You can read a book you've read before and just love. Why? Why would you want to do that? Because you spend a lot of time every day with uncertainty. And when you pick up a book that you love and you start to reread it, you're, you tell your brain, I can predict this. This is certain. This isn't scary. Nothing bad's going to happen. This is going to be fun. This is going to be enjoyable. This is going to be meaningful. Watch a film that you haven't seen in years that you just loved. It's predictable. Even if you don't remember the story, even if you don't remember the ending, you know you loved it. You're, it'll be like visiting an old friend you haven't seen in a long time. So you can do things that are predictable. Um, find an, an old recipe that something you haven't had in a long time and cook that. It's familiar. That familiarity will be very soothing. Balance all of the newness, all of the scary things, all of the uncertainty that's around us all the time with at least some predictability every day. It's really good for our emotional system. So this is another way of saying to, we can replace the fear of the unknown or uncertainty with curiosity. Curiosity is another step. Okay, one step is predictability, doing something you've done before. Another is doing something new, but where we can really muster up some curiosity, which makes it fun, interest. Like, I'm curious about this. This is throwing ourselves into things that maybe aren't so scary, that aren't so life and death, that aren't terrible. You know, you don't have to be researching things that have to do with your finances or um, what happens if you miss a mortgage payment or a rent payment. You can be looking into something new that's, that's not likely to be scary that we can just be curious about. Our brains love fun curiosity. Okay, fun curiosity has a very different impact on our brain than uncertainty, which is also unknown. All right, what about this unjustified fear? Well, one thing about unjustified fear is As I said earlier, even if it might be dangerous in the future or was dangerous in the past, it's not dangerous right now. And so this requires us to practice noticing this moment. So right now, what I'd like you to do is to notice that wherever you are, 
actually at this moment, I'm pretty sure you're safe. I'm not talking about what might not happen tomorrow or in six weeks or six months, but right now. Take a deep breath and just take in, soak in where you are. This is a safe place to be. Notice your shoes or your socks or your slippers and notice that you can wiggle your toes around and feel comfortable. It's perfectly safe. This is a safe moment. You've probably already done plenty of things to plan how to keep things safe, to minimize risk and danger. You probably have. If you haven't, absolutely do more. Plan around that. Spend a certain amount of time on that. And do some problem solving on that. However, thinking about those things more and more and more doesn't make it safer. It just makes our brains get overwhelmed. We've got to notice, yep, I've done the safety planning, and now I'm safe for this moment. Might be different tomorrow, something could happen tomorrow, but right now, things are safe. <sighs> Take it in. Notice it. Do a little smile at like the situation. Not like a happy smile, but a like it's safe, it's okay. It's not a disaster at this moment. I would encourage you to do that intermittently more often every day than, than those episodes where you're faced with something that's scary and dangerous. So if you've got 20 of those episodes, do 30 noticing safety, noticing that it's safe. If you've got two of those, do three or four, notice that it's safe. Again. This is about, remember, emotions are things we do. This is about influencing what our emotions do. And our attention, how we pay attention to ourselves and the context in which we live is one of the most important things we can do to influence that stream of emotion. All right, now let's move on to grief. Inhibited grief. All right, what do we mean by inhibited or mistreated? That means that the loss is present or has already happened and we haven't successfully grieved it. Now, I'm not talking about Kubler Ross's stages of grieving. That's a completely different way of thinking about this. It's, it's fine. But I, I want to talk about things that we can do in 30 seconds that are very helpful. You can spend more time on it, but actually, being able to do this for 30 seconds at a time is very powerful and gives us a very real sense that we can influence our own emotion and our own experience in life. All right, so the first thing here, okay, is to identify one loss. Now, I just want to say that there are so many for, for everybody, right? So think about work social things, school, money, all these things, that, restaurants, movies, concerts, dancing, things that require public spaces, certain vacations and travel, okay, all kinds of things that you might have already had planned that you couldn't do. Now, we're talking about grieving real losses, which means they really are lost. So something that might not happen in September is not a loss yet. Something that you planned on in June that's now been canceled is a real loss, at least for June. Even if it's rescheduled, it's still a real loss. So for the kids, oh my gosh, there's so many. Uh, I have a, I have a, my youngest child is a senior in high school. And, uh, so there's no prom there. All the activities that seniors do the last uh, semester of their senior year, nope, all done. Um, no more performances, no more concerts, no more plays, nothing, right? And possibly no graduation. Oh my goodness. Um, if your kids are in college or you're in college, you just, you got booted out of the middle of your semester. There are enormous losses associated with that. 
There also could be huge losses, like the death of a loved one. The principles here are the same, but the amount of time and energy and difficulty of grieving a huge loss is, of course, bigger than grieving a more modest loss. But what I want to say is that, that it's not for anybody except you to say how big the loss is. That's yours. So something that might for somebody else be not that big a deal could be enormous for you. And that means you'll have to do this practice quite a few times. Please don't invalidate yourself. If it feels like a loss, if you're sad about it, and it's a loss, there's no, no benefit in saying, oh, it shouldn't bother me, or that's not a big deal. That's just self-invalidating. That's just inhibiting your grieving. So the first thing you got to do is pick one circumscribed loss. Like, okay, I didn't get to do, you know, we had tickets to do this concert, you know, last week. We didn't get to go. We had, we were planning on going you know, around here in the Boston area. You know, we had plans to go to Fenway Park uh, and see the Red Sox in the 2020 season. Didn't happen. You know, that's already not happened. We don't know what's going to happen later, but already that has, has not happened. Uh, trips that you might have planned that didn't happen uh, or certainly aren't going to happen. Pick one and only one. Now notice, okay, just notice only that. Build a little fence around it and say, that's the thing I've lost. I didn't get to do that. What is it? What does that disappointment feel like? Where do you feel it in your body? What are the sensations? What are your urges? Do you feel a tightness in your chest, lump in your throat, teary, tightness in your neck? What is it? Just notice those things. Those are real. They aren't going to be with you forever. In fact, paradoxically, the more you can just allow that experience to be your own, the more successful you can leave this. So just notice that experience. Now, allow that thing to come and go. Emotions have a natural history. Emotions rise and they fall. They're things we do. So things trigger them and they go up and then they come down and then other things happen. Now, if we keep thinking about the same thing, it can feel like our emotions go up and stay up for a long time. That's because we keep re-triggering the same emotion. So if you pair your emotion on the upswing with a breath in, like, okay, I'm going to notice this and breathe in. And I'm going to let go of the emotion as I breathe out. Actually, that turns out to be about how long an emotion fires, something like three to nine seconds, something like that. And a deep breath takes that same similar range of time. So you kind of have a deep breath of sadness, grief and loss, and let it go. And you can do that for one or two or three breaths. You can do it for longer, but you don't have to. Because you can do it again tomorrow, or again in two weeks, or again in 20 minutes. You don't have to get buried, overwhelmed, like it's a tsunami washing over you. You can take a piece of it. If it's big and it hurts, you can self-soothe. You can then, after you finish this, after you finish uh, this allowing the emotion for a little bit, you can listen to some soothing music. You can go splash some cold water in your face. You can go have a cold drink of water or, you know, a hot cup of tea, something that's soothing. Um, you can read something from your favorite book. Look outside and appreciate something out your window. Okay, something that's soothing to one of your senses. You can self-validate and say, yeah, of course this is sad. Of course I don't like this. It makes sense. And then finally, if you need to, you can seek validation and support from other people. Now, this other people thing is really important because when we seek validation from other people, we have to give them enough information. We have to be accurate in our expression so they understand us. And if they understand us, it's easy to validate and say, oh my gosh, right? Just like, I got so scared, this truck pulled through a red light and almost hit me. Oh my gosh, that must have been scary. It's so easy to validate when we understand the emotion and its connection to the events that happen. In order to be accurate in our expression, we have to be able to manage our emotions because otherwise we won't express it accurately. It'll come out more as judgment. It'll come out more in secondary emotion terms and be harder to understand. And of course, for somebody to be able to validate, they have to manage their emotions too. 
you know, for us to be validated, we have to manage our emotions. Otherwise, we can't pay attention to the other person. We misinterpret. We misinterpret. All right, and then finally, we have to reactivate. We have to get going. We don't just stay stuck in the emotion and the soothing and the validation because then we're still in grief. Now we gotta like actually reactivate, get going. Say, okay, I'm done with that for now. What was I doing? Okay, now bring my attention to something else. What was I gonna do now? I was gonna eat lunch. Oh, I was going to, you know, go send an, an email to a friend to set up a, you know, a, a Zoom date. You know, who knows what. Say not now to anything else that gets in the way and savor the experience that now you're doing something different. Enjoy that experience. Now you're doing something else. That sadness can linger. It can sit on the back burner for a while, but it, let it go with you. You don't have to push it away. If you allow it to be there, but bring your attention to the next minute and the next minute and the next activity, what happens is those new events create new emotions and eventually don't leave much room for the sadness. And then later, if it's, you know, it might, you might have to do it again. You might be sad again. It's important to mix the predictable and the familiar, as we talked about earlier, with new and interesting things, low key with high energy things. And to mix some kind of things that we do by ourselves with social things. Absolutely essential to make choices, to be purposeful, to not just be passive, and let whatever screams at us grab our attention. Make a decision. What am I going to do now? Even though that's screaming at me, it's not a good use of my time. That's not a good use of my emotional energy. I'm going to do this instead. This will help us build new routines that become more familiar, and we can practice being flexible and open to these new challenges. All right, so in closing, Really, what we're talking about is using this new structure that we're building and our being purposeful uh, in our consumption to do things every day to be safe, to be healthy, not just physically healthy. That's important with exercise and eating, uh, sleeping and so forth, but also healthy in terms of what we're consuming with our minds. So stay active and bring our attention with us. Stay engaged in the things that we do to self-validate and self-soothe, stay in the present, not get stuck in the past, not get stuck in the future. That's not, we don't know what's going to happen. To bring our curiosity with us, always purposeful, finding balance, and of course, being as, as loving as we can towards others, because as loving as we are towards others, they're much more likely to be loving back. So we know that being validating, is very soothing and creates a lot of closeness and meaning in our lives. And, uh, I hope that this has given you uh, some ideas of things that you can do with some of the really intense emotions of fear and worry, um, as well as grief and sadness. And so now I think we have time for some questions. So Alan, I just want to thank you so much. Um, we've gotten some great feedback and I know everyone who was listening really enjoyed your presentation. I would like to remind everyone that is listening, we are a nonprofit organization and we're able to offer free programs and webinars because we have the generous support of people like you. And we'd ask that you please consider making a donation to the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder. You can find the link to donate on our website, www.neab.org. And I'm going to turn it over now to Tina and Nancy and Doreen. They've been following the chat and Q&A and have some questions for you. Okay, Alan, I've got your first question. So um, one of our participants described emotions as something that we do, or are they something that we feel? And can you differentiate or explain a little more? Well, oh, um, both. <laughs> um, so when I say something that we do, what that means is that it's, it's, it's an activity. It's a behavior. And the feeling part is the awareness part of it, right? So for example, it's easy enough. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, but taken, you know, back when it maybe at some point when you were driving to work or taking a bus or a subway to work, 
you walk into work or you end up home, you come home and you think, wait a minute, how did I get here? I, I don't remember how I got here, right? You certainly did the behavior of driving or riding a bus or riding a subway but without much awareness. You didn't have the experience of it. Emotions are the same thing. We have the emotions even if we're not aware of them. The feeling is when we're aware of them. The doing is whether we're aware of them or not. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think so. I think so. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, Nan Nancy, did you have a question for? Yes, I have. Okay. Some. Awesome. Um, Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Presetti. That was absolutely wonderful. And this question actually came through in many different versions. Um, mm -hmm. How do you respond to a family member who is exclusively squandering time on numbing activities, uh, who deflects discussing the issue as being judgmental, responding, I'm doing what I want to be doing right now? Yeah, what a great question. Um, and of course, this is super common. I mean, this. I hope this, this person knows uh, you have good company in the world, uh, mm -hmm. including many people who are probably watching this um, and or somebody that they know. So it's a, the answer, of course, is not a simple one. It's to think of this as a process where all we can do with a loved one, when the loved one is doing something that, is, that we think is creating them a lot of suffering, all we can do is is offer is invite them to do something different uh, and offer our love and support to do something different. Um, we can be solid and loving and peaceful, which I think is really an invitation for most people. I don't know about, I think if you think about people in your, in your world, in your life, who are genuinely at peace, present, alert, you know, peaceful doesn't mean asleep. It means not judgmental, not angry right um there's something attractive about that people gravitate to people who are in a balance right so if we can be the balance for someone that we love and invite them to say hey honey um i i, I know this is such a just you know validate i know this is such a distressing time there's a lot on your mind just say you know what is on your mind what what do you what do you what are you focusing on you know and, and, you know, let them do more talking and us more listening. Mm -hmm. And in the, the first time you do that, the person might just say, nothing. The trick is, is to let that go. That, that's, that's strike. That's, that's, that's my first foray. This is going to take 30 tries, right? The second one is, hey, what you've been doing? You know, oh, how is that? You know, and then sooner or later, the invitation is like, you get a little more. And then you can say, it, se it seems like you're, it seems like you're getting really kind of down after you do that. Um, is that is that true? Instead of being certain, ask the question: Is that true? Be curious. These steps over time, and it's a lot of steps. It's a lot of allowing. It requires us to manage our emotion really well. That doesn't mean we can't say, "Honey, I love you. I'm worried because you seem really unhappy." That's okay course but not a demand like I want you to try something different not solving the problem for the other person because I mean how well do you like it when somebody tells you what to do like, who likes that right so even when we're right okay even when the other person's right who likes being told you know do it this way it's much better for you ah, leave me alone leave me alone I mean nobody nobody likes that so it, think of it as a process many 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 steps that are that where you get increasingly aware of what's going on and then your invitation could be, hey, how about, you know, hey, I found this interesting X, you know, whatever your loved one likes, you know, or might be close to what they like. Movie, podcast, uh, website, book, um, song, um, who knows? I mean, I, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm limiting myself to things that are, that we can do in limited circumstances or take out food or something. How about we try this and then share that experience. It has an invitation to do something else and notice how nice that is. And that's all we can do. Also accept the limitations that we, we can't control it as much as we might want to, because we love somebody and it's very hard to watch somebody suffer that we love. Absolutely. 
Um, Alan, we had a question about primary and secondary emotions. Do you have any there are tips? There so many of, questions about that. Yes, go ahead. You know, any tips of how, you, uh, of how a person might um, recognize those different emotions, if, what they're feeling? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a really good question, and I, and I actually have a straight answer to that. The, the, the straight answer is the following. If you imagine the situation, right, anybody in that situation, how would anybody feel? That's that as human beings, we're hardwired to have primary emotions, right? So when I, I can't imagine that anybody, when I said, Hey, I, I pulled out of my green light and a truck came, ran the red light and I was scared. I can't imagine anybody thought, why was he scared? What's the big deal there? You know, why, you know, that's no big, I can't imagine that, that anybody wouldn't understand the validity of being afraid in that moment. Right? Anybody would feel afraid in that moment. Now then, of course, the car driving thing, somebody cuts you off, that's more complicated. And some people really get angry and some people get scared. That's a harder one to know. So then you have to think, well, what would somebody who's never been in this situation before feel? Right? It's the, you know, you're Henry Ford. You just, you just, you just built a, a hundred cars and the first person just cut the first person off. It just happened. I'm pretty sure that person felt scared, not angry. Right? So uh, thinking about it in the general sense is, is, is often the way to find that primary emotion. What would you feel at any age, any place on the planet, any culture, e you know, any gender, you know, just what would anybody feel? Okay. All right, Nancy, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, can you discuss feelings of grief connected with distant family illness? which we have no control so um, so when someone is ill um, but they're they're going to be okay and it doesn't particularly um, have an impact on how we relate to that person right so if they're distant you weren't going to see them this week anyway there's no loss for us so the grieving it's more that's more empathy right so, you know, Nancy, if, if you were ill, but not deathly ill, okay, and, um, you know, Nancy, you live far away, you know, we only see each other occasionally on Zoom, right? So I, but I could certainly have a lot of empathy. I could be very sad that you are ill and having a rough time, or anybody. That sadness is empathy. It's empathy sadness. It's not grief, because I haven't lost anything. Now, if your illness gets in the way, we were supposed to, our family was supposed to get together for a vacation next week, and you can't do that, well, then there's, I have grief and loss about that. We don't get to do something that's really fun. That's, a, that's grieving. That's, I also could have empathy for you. It'd also be your loss, and you'd be sad, and I'd have empathy about that, too. So it's a good example of where sadness, that big umbrella of sadness, includes a lot of different emotions. Not, it includes grief, but also disappointment, it's loneliness, and then empathy for someone else's loss or struggle. Okay. Does that answer it? Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and then I had one more question, Alan, with, you could, you touched on it briefly. So there are a lot of um, seniors you'd mentioned in school that they're going to miss their prom and they're not going to have graduation. And then on the other hand too, there's parents that also are going to be grieving this. Yeah. Do you have any, um, any words of wisdom or advice of how they can not only comfort their loved one, but kind of comfort themselves too? Yeah. Well, I think parents are in a particularly, they have a tricky role because on the one hand, we as parents have some of the same, you know, feelings of grief and loss, but it's very important to not turn those conversations into being about our experience of it. We need to get support from other adults for our, our grief and loss. That doesn't mean we can't share it with our children, but the idea is to, is to keep the focus on our kids' grief and loss. They don't have the maturity in the years and the experience. They need, they need more help. They need more support and validation. And kids that are, you know, at that age, you know, they're still kids. And 
all the, I'm not saying I'm not in any way uh, saying that they don't have empathy and validation skills, but it's not really their job to take care of their parents. It's really still our job to help take care of them. That doesn't mean we can't share, say, oh, I'm so disappointed for you. Oh my gosh, that's terrible for you. And how do you feel? And then to also add, like, I'm disappointed too. I was really looking forward to this. But it's it's proportional. It's like not to suggest in any way that our grief and sadness for our child is in the same league. You know, because it's different. It's just different. It doesn't one doesn't have to be bigger or smaller, but with our child we keep we we're accurate, but we don't we don't grow it to its full extent. With another adult, we might have this much. We might say to the other parent or to a, a best friend or a sibling that we're close to, oh, I'm just so, you know, you know, we can have a lot of emotion about it because then it's about our emotion. So it's really knowing what, what are we trying to accomplish in this conversation? Keeping our roles clear. So we have a ton more questions that could come through, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time because it is oh, yeah. after four o'clock. Um, as with the other webinars, we will review the questions that we have received and we will send you an answer via email if you have given us your name and we are able to answer the question. We're not able to answer questions that are really specific to people's situations without knowing the people in the situation. It's hard for us to answer specifically, but the general questions we will try and get to. Dr. Frazetti, I wanna thank you so much for your time and for doing this. Um, you will see when you look at the chats and the Q&A how much everyone loved it. And I thank you so much for taking the time with us on this Friday afternoon to teach us and for us to learn together. So thank well, you very a much. Pleasure. Thanks, Abby, for organizing this. And thanks, everybody, yeah. for, for coming and joining us. And uh, I hope you have a really safe uh, and lovely weekend. And don't forget to notice that it's safe when it is. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.